answer the questions in the chat box. All right, so with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this series is. So welcome to Zoom as Scientists. This is a series sponsored by Lake Champlain Sea Grant and UVM education um, program known as Watershed Alliance. Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of the Lake Champlain Basin. As for the Watershed Alliance program, it's a Lake Champlain Sea Grant education program that aims to reach K through 12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in youth throughout Vermont and New York, as well as others. It seems that we're reaching other people in other states, which is great. The Zuma Scientist series was created in response to the current need for more virtual programs. This will be done every Tuesday and Friday from now until the end of June. Uh, we will be hosting a guest scientist to tell us more about the research in the basin. Just as a heads up, this webinar is currently being live streamed to our Lake Champlain YouTube channel. This is just another avenue for our teachers and students to view these presentations. Additionally, all webinars are being uploaded to our YouTube channel um, shortly after the presentation is concluded. That way you can view and share the presentations with whomever you may like. So without further ado, let me introduce um, today's guest speaker. And I'm gonna pass the floor over to Ashley on this one. Great, thanks Caroline. Awesome introduction to our program. So we are so psyched today. So we have Jason Scott here with us. Jason Scott is a Lieutenant Commander in the US Coast Guard. He also is a recent, uh, well, he'll be completing his master's this spring here at the University of Vermont um, in natural resources. So he has been an active duty in the United States Coast Guard um, for the duration of his career. He specializes in disaster response, contingency planning, and environmental protection. Um, Jason has worked on oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, Alaska, and Puerto Rico, to name a few. He also has assisted with major hurricane relief efforts, um, most recently in Puerto Rico and then um, New Orleans. And so following graduation, um, Jason will be heading down to DC to work in the Office of Marine and Environmental Response. And so Jason is gonna share a little bit about his expertise in um, oil disaster response, as well as share his current graduate research, which is about oil response here on Lake Champlain. So welcome, Jason, and we are so excited to have you here today. All right, so here's our transition slide, Jason. You get the ability to then share your screen, um, as well as make sure if you want to turn off your video as well as uh, turn on your video as well as your microphone. Okay. Awesome, let me get to share screen here. Okay. All right, well, thank you for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, and thank you to Sea Grant for putting on this awesome webinar series. Um, given our current situation, uh, it's really great to have this series going on. And I appreciate the opportunity to um, share my research and some of the work I've done um, uh, with you all. So with that, um, the title of my presentation is um, Oil Spill. Excuse me. Uh, is oil spill. And what I'm going to talk about here is, um, well, what oil are we talking about? How do oil spills occur? How do oil spills affect the environment? What can we do to clean up oil spills? And at the end, I'll, I'll cover a little bit of my research uh, for my master's degree surrounding oil spills and Lake Champlain. First, where does oil come from? So most people think that oil comes from dinosaurs. Um, in fact, it does not come from dinosaurs. Uh, oil was formed from mostly marine organisms, um, namely single cell bacteria and algae um, that died 300 to 400 million years ago before the time of dinosaurs. And as it sunk down to the, to the bottom of the oceans and the lakes, um, it was then covered over with sediment. And when it did that, um, because of the, the, the depths, the lack of oxygen and the sediment now covering those marine organisms, um, they were unable to break down as they normally would. So these organisms were then encased in this porous sedimentary rock. As more sediment formed on top of it and the pressure increased and the heat increased, 
um, over the course of millions of years, um, it was pressed, those marine organisms were pressed and became oil. Um, and that oil is now encased in porous sedimentary rock trapped underneath layers of sediment and rock um, all around the earth um, in the earth's crust. And so you can see on the right hand side, um, an oil derrick that is um, pulling oil out of the earth's crust uh, from those that trapped gas and oil uh, down in those rocks. Here's a map of some of the North American oil reserves. This, the areas shaded in gray are the areas um, that we are currently um, taking oil out of the ground. Um, as you notice, uh, there are many areas around the Gulf of Mexico um, for the US and Texas, Louisiana is a big hotspot up through the Western part of the US and on up to the North Slope of Alaska. Um, and these are all the areas where we're currently um, drilling and pulling oil out of the ground. So what do we do with crude oil? So when crude oil comes out of the ground, it's a raw, black, sticky oil. Um, and again, it's a, uh, it's a naturally occurring chemical um, called a hydrocarbon, mostly made up of hydrogen and carbon. Um, and, and we can't really do much with crude oil itself. So it goes to refineries. Um, it's transported to refineries where they use uh, the process of fractional uh, distillation, which they basically um, cook it. And at different temperatures, they're able to draw off the lighter end fuels on up to the heaviest fuels. And so at the, the, the lower temperatures, um, the fuels with a low boiling point that are very volatile, um, smaller molecules, they flow very easily, come off. So that's your liquid petroleum gas, your gasoline like you would put in your cars, um, diesel fuel, home heating oil, things like that. Um, and then as you get kind of into the higher temperatures, you get the larger molecule um, hydrocarbons. They have a much lower boiling point. They're a little less volatile. Um, they're harder to ignite. Um, and so these are your lubricating oils or your motor oil, like for your car, heavy fuel oils that are used to power um, large ships. Um, and then finally, asphalt and tar, which are used for um, paving roads, uh, doing roofs. And to the left, you can see the products that are made from a barrel of crude oil. So a barrel of crude oil is 42 gallons. That's an international standard volume. And you can see almost 70% um, out, of a, out of 42 gallons of crude oil, for, uh, almost 70% is made into gasoline, diesel fuel, and heating oil. And these are our major uses um, of, of oil in, in the world. Um, the remaining 30% become uh, things like heavy fuel oils, uh, jet fuel, liquid petroleum, and things like asphalt. So how do spills occur? Spills can be caused by many different things. Um, people making mistakes or being careless, human error, um, in the, especially in the transportation realm, um, equipment breaking down, natural disasters such as hurricanes and floods, or deliberate acts by terrorists. Sorry, uh, terrorists, uh, hurricanes, uh, sorry, countries at war, vandals or illegal dumpers. And you can see some pictures here on the left, a uh, pipeline. Um, this is the Trans-Alaska pipeline that somebody shot at. Um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which was um, back in 2010, was caused from a, um, overpressurization of a uh, submerged well uh, on the seafloor. And then the last picture is a, uh, a result of a barge collision. Boats and marinas are a major cause of, of oil and oil spills entering the environment. Um, the picture on the left is a, is a boat that caught on fire at a marina and burned and released uh, fuel oil into the, into the water. Um, the picture on the right is a fishing vessel up in Alaska. Um, they were transferring fuel from tank to tank on board the, the boat and um, they experienced an overfill of one of their tanks which ran out onto the deck and into the water. Uh, land and storage facilities can be sources of spills. So the refineries that I talked about, um, the large uh, oil storage facilities, the one on the, the picture on the right is actually the global oil storage facility down near Letty Park in Burlington. And these um, facilities are all over the country. And this is where they store fuel oils before they're distributed out to gas stations and people's homes. Um, and then the picture on the left is a facility that was flooded from a hurricane. Um, and again, during hurricanes, 
and flooding, um, many containers are damaged and oil can be released from these containers um, and get into the environment. Prior to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, Hurricane Katrina was actually the largest oil spill in US history, um, releasing over 100 million gallons of oil um, out into the environment due to the hurricane. Oil tankers is what most people think of um, when they see uh, or when they're thinking about an oil spill um, as oil tankers take uh, raw crude oil from the production areas in Alaska, the Middle East and other areas and, and transport it to refineries or transport it to market. The Eagle Atome on the left was a, a barge that collided with an oil tanker in the port of uh, Port Arthur, Texas. And on the right is the Exxon Valdez, um, which of course is one of the more famous spills um, in the US anyways. And that was a spill that occurred up in Prince William Sound in Alaska. Railroads are also a major um, uh, cause for oil spills. The picture on the left is a unit oil train, and that's actually along the shores of Lake Champlain over on the New York side. The train tracks run around, along around 100 miles of shoreline along the lake, um, sometimes within feet of the lake, as you see here. Um, and, and that oil is um, transported along those lines uh, from Montreal down to Albany. And then on the right is a, an actual train derailment. Um, and you can see how the rail cars are all piled up on one another. And then it, um, most of the rail cars were damaged, releasing their oil into those, the farmer's fields. Uh, pipelines are also a major uh, source of spills. Um, pipelines carry oil from the middle of the country um, and Canada down to Gulf Coast refineries. This was a spill that occurred in Michigan um, a few years back. And it was actually, you can see on the right, there was a large rupture of the pipeline and it released several million gallons of, of crude oil um, directly into a river. There's also natural seeps um, that cause oil spills. Um, the picture on the right is, um, is sheening. Um, that's what we call oil when it's on the surface of the water and it kind of has like a metallic uh, color to it. It's called a sheen. And that oil is naturally seeping up out of um, the, the, the seabed in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so there's, there's not a whole lot we can do to stop those, but oil does naturally um, come into the environment. And then to the left is the La Brea Tar Pits in California. Uh, most of you have probably seen these before, but that is a natural seep of a tar-like material that's naturally coming up out of the earth. And finally, offshore oil production. And of course, um, the, the most recent large oil spill that most people can remember or have heard about is the Deepwater Horizon. And as we push farther out into the seabed to drill for oil, um, you know, the Deepwater Horizon was in 5,000 feet of water. Um, there's an increased risk of spills from those wellheads. It, the oil can release from the wellhead itself. It can release from the pipes that are connecting the wellhead up to the, the drilling platform or the tankers. Um, and then we can have spills from the actual platforms or tanker themselves. All right, so how do oil spills affect the environment? Oil spills can affect um, animals and plants in two ways. The first is exposure to the oil itself. And the second is the impact from the response or cleanup operations. And as you can see in the right, this is a picture uh, from the Exxon Valdez spill in 1989. And it's like a small army on this little beach. And these folks are using high pressure water. Um, sometimes it's actually heated high pressure water to wash the oil off of the, the rocks and cobbles on that beach to try and get it back out into the water where they can actually collect it. And what happened in, in many areas of Prince William Sound in Alaska was that these beaches were effectively sterilized. They killed all the living organisms um, uh, from, from the larger organisms down to the microorganisms that lived on that beach. And many of those areas are still sterile to this day. They have not made a full recovery. So we don't use this practice anymore, but many um, oil spill cleanup operations include a lot of people, heavy equipment, and can severely damage the environment or impact wildlife along the way. In terms of the oil itself, um, spilled oil can be poisonous. Um, it can affect organisms both from internal exposure to oil through ingestion or, or eating it um, through their mouth inhalation or breathing in the fumes, and from external exposure um, from skin and eye irritations. Oil and its uh, chemical fractions can also have a major effect on microorganisms and in their early life stages, especially like larval stages for fish and invertebrates um, and many other marine and aquatic species. 
Here's a picture of the food web. I'm sure many of you have, have uh, discussed the food web, maybe in your science classes. Um, but when oil gets into the environment, um, you can see all the various areas where the oil is affecting the environment here. So um, all the way to the left, um, the oil has impacted the shoreline there, and it's impacting shorebirds and other um, animals that live on the shore. Um, it's affecting the shallow seagrass beds and the coral reefs in the more tropical areas. Um, it's affecting um, the pelagic area where you have a lot of fish that swim and, and large marine mammals. Also your populations of phytoplankton and zooplankton that live up in the photic zone where the area where the, the sun is able to reach on the very tops of the ocean and, and lakes. Um, and then also it can affect the, the deep sea communities as well especially spills that are from uh, the seabed, like Deepwater Horizon. And once these oil slicks start to break up on the surface of the water, um, it, it starts to disperse down into the water column. And so it starts to affect the phytoplankton um, communities. Um, they'll either ingest it and it can make them sick or kill them, um, or it can um, adsorb to the outside of these, these organisms. And then it can be passed through the food chain through bioaccumulation. Um, and so, that little bit becomes a little bit more in the next, um, you know, up to the, the plankton, um, up to the invertebrates, up to the larval fish stage, up to the larger fish, and then on up into marine mammals, and even into humans if we continue to, to uh, eat the, the fish that have been impacted by this. So it can really disrupt the entire food chain. What organisms are most affected by oil spills? Since most oils uh, float um, on water, the creatures most affected by spills um, are sea otters and seabirds be found living on the sea surface. Um, really any marine mammals that come up to the surface to breathe uh, can be affected by spills. But specifically, um, birds and, and otters are really susceptible because that, that thick oil, um, these, the birds and sea otters rely on their own natural oils. Um, you see them preening a lot and they keep their natural oils on the outer part of their fur and feathers. And that helps them to remain waterproof. And the oil is actually um, a bit corrosive and eats through their natural oils. And it allows the water to penetrate through their fur or their feathers and get right to their skin. And most of these birds um, and otters die from hypothermia because they can't maintain their body temperature. Um, and they, they, they're not really equipped to kind of deal with that. Um, and then of course, they're trying to preen themselves and they're, by doing that, they're ingesting the oil. So it's a pretty sad thing. Um, if oil does remain in the environment for a long time, it can also affect um, other creatures that um, live uh, in the intertidal zone, things like snails, clams, and other terrestrial animals. So as we talked about previously, there's kind of the lighter fuel oils, um, and then there's the heavier oils. They have difference, differences about how they affect wildlife and how long they stay in the environment. Fuel oils such as gasoline and diesel fuel are light oils. Um, they're very volatile, meaning they evaporate very quickly from the environment. That's why there's not really a whole lot that we can do for gasoline um, and even sometimes diesel spills. It's a very light fuel and it evaporates so quickly um, and it spreads very thin along the surface of the water, so it makes it very hard to recover. So usually those are kind of left in place and just monitored. Um, but the lighter fuels um, do not remain um, in the aquatic or marine environment for very long. They spread very thin and they evaporate quickly. Light oils present two significant hazards. First, um, they can ignite or explode, which is dangerous for wildlife, also dangerous for responders and humans. Um, and like I said, they were, they're toxic. They can kill animals or plants that they touch. Um, and they can also be dangerous to humans, breathing those same fumes or getting it on their skin. The heavy oils are a little more difficult. And that's why um, most oil spill prevention and preparedness activities are aimed at halting the spill of heavy oils and crude oils. Um, bunker oils, heavy fuel oils, and crude oils look very black and can remain very sticky. Um, and they, they have a habit of actually coating the environment and they can, they can uh, harm wildlife and plants by actually smothering them and preventing them from breathing, um, getting oxygen, um, and performing their essential functions. Um, Heavier oils are typically less acutely, um, they're less acutely toxic and they're more in the chronic toxicity side, meaning they persist for a very long time in the environment, um, sometimes um, months to years. Um, and so their, their damage, environmental damage can last for a long time 
um, and, and uh, but again, not as acutely toxic. These are some, some pictures that I took um, when I was stationed in Alaska. Um, I had the opportunity to go out to a beach that was heavily oiled by the, um, the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And this was a beach where they decided that it was gonna be more harm to the environment to try and remove the oil than to just leave it. And so we went to this beach, we were able to dig down about 12 inches down and still found fresh oil, um, fresh oil uh, that would seep out through the um, interstitial areas in the sand um, and come out into the water. And so I actually have a jar of this oil right here. Um, and this is oil that I collected in, in 2017, so almost 30 years after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And that oil is still there. Um, and, and unfortunately, it's mostly below the water line. And so there's very little oxygen getting to it. So it's taking the environment a really long time um, to get rid of that oil on its own. So that's just an example of how persistent these heavy oils can be. So what can we do to clean up oil spills? Um, the first thing we can do is have a system in place um, to help manage oil spill cleanups. And so we have a system um, of federal regulations that require contingency plans. And these plans um, offer uh, support from the federal level down to the state and local level for how to respond to an oil spill. Also, industry, um, people that are, are drilling oil or transporting oil are also required to have these plans and have thought up already how they're going to respond to if they were to have a spill. Um, we also have the national response system, which is shown on the screen, which is a system to organize the response to a spill um, and kind of name names of who's going to be involved from the state on-scene coordinator, the federal on-scene coordinator, the responsible party or the person who spilled the oil, and all the different special teams that can be involved um, to help us be the, the most efficient that we can in cleaning up oil spills. So the number one tool that we use to clean up oil spills is called containment boom. The containment boom does not absorb the oil. It's merely a tool, um, it's a plastic or rubberized um, floating boom that is used to collect oil on the surface of the water. So most oil floats. Um, so these boom have a flotation um, section that floats on the top of the water. And then they have what's called a skirt that's actually down underneath the water that you don't see. And so that oil will float on the top couple inches of the water. Um, and so you can collect the oil, you can prevent it from um, affecting a very sensitive area like a wetland, um, or you can hold it in a specific area until you're able to actually collect that oil off the surface of the water. So mechanical recovery um, is how we collect that oil off the surface of the water. And this is always our first choice in an oil spill. These are pictures of various skimmers that are available. Um, these skimmers are used to actually collect the oil and completely remove it from the environment. There's many different types of skimmers. Um, in the upper right is a drum skimmer. And those wheels that are on there circle around, the oil adheres to it. And then as it comes back around, there's a little squeegee blade on there. And it squeegees the oil off into a little reservoir in the back where it can then be pumped out um, and pumped into a storage tank and taken for disposal. The other two types that are pictured there are a weir type skimmer where it, um, it floats the skimmer right at the oil, oil water interface and allows only the oil to pour over into a little bucket where it's then pumped out and pumped up onto a boat where there's storage tanks waiting. In situ burning is another tactic, um, although rarely used and only used in offshore oil spills. Um, it was used extensively during the Deepwater Horizon spill um, where many millions of gallons were actually burned off the surface of the water. So to do this, you need fresh oil you need a way to ignite it safely, um, and it needs to be away from human populations and sensitive wildlife that could be affected by the smoke. Chemical dispersants are another way that um, we use to combat oil spills. And basically, oil on the surface of the water wants to remain in a, in a thick um, black slick. And when you do that, um, it, it, it kind of stays and wants to persist in the environment. It doesn't want to go away. So when we use chemical dispersants, um, they spray this dispersant on top of the oil and it actually helps break up the oil slick into tiny little droplets. And when they break up the oil slick like that, um, it makes more surface area and more area for bacterial colonization 
um, and the bacteria can get at that oil and actually naturally break it down, which I'll go into in my next slide. Oh, maybe it's a few slides. Um, sorbent materials are another way, um, especially for smaller spills. And this is what we would see more often in Lake Champlain in a small spill at a marina, um, is using sorbent materials like this. Um, so you have sorbent pads in the upper left, sorbent boom in the, in the lower left, um, and then speedy dry, which kind of looks like kitty litter, um, and then snare, which kind of looks like pom-poms. And all these are specifically formulated um, to absorb only oil off the surface of the water. So you can throw, the, throw these pads or the boom down on the water um, and it will absorb only the oil and not the water. And then they can be collected and disposed of properly. And so many, you know, some of you, your parents may have some, some pads like this um, in their garage maybe for changing oil in cars or, or helping to clean up. Um, and they're, they're commercially available and, and, and very good tools for absorbing oil. We also get a little help from nature and there's many natural processes that can help remove oil from water. Um, as you know, it won't remove it completely from the environment, but it, it will remove it from water. So the sun is always our friend um, and the sun can uh, evaporate large portions, especially of the lighter oils, but even some of the heavier oils. Um, it can oxidate um, some of the oil that's sitting on the surface of the water. So that means that it's actually gonna change the chemical composition of that oil. We have emulsification and dispersion through wind um, and natural wave action. Um, that, that oil slick that's sitting on the surface of the water can actually be broken up and naturally disperse um, out into the water column where it's, where it's less toxic and more available for, for biodegradation, which you also see there. Um, just a, a little uh, picture there on the right. Um, this is an oil budget that's estimated from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill um, and, and where they think the fate of all the oil was that spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. And if you notice down at the bottom, 41% was either naturally dispersed or evaporated. So nature directly took care of an estimated 41% of that spill, which is pretty amazing. 8% was chemically dispersed. 3% was skimmed or with our mechanical skimmers removed from the surface of the water. And 5% was burned. Here's those oil eating microbes. So these are naturally occurring microbes. Um, they exist more often in areas where there are natural seeps um, to where they've been able to um, have a constant food source. Um, so the Gulf of Mexico, uh, for instance, has a lot of these oil eating microbes. And uh, it's, it's pretty basic what they do, but oil being a naturally occurring uh, chemical, these microbes just see the oil as a carbon food source. So they take oxygen out of the water or out of the air and they break the oil, the hydrocarbons apart um, into their, their, their carbon and hydrogen um, portions. And they basically make carbon dioxide and water. Uh, so it's pretty amazing. And um, during spills, what we really wanna do is let the microbes eat and give them the best opportunity we can by breaking up the oil spill into small little droplets and letting nature take care of it um, on its own. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but th here's just a, a really cool graphic from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill response um, showing the various levels um, from shoreline out to 50 miles offshore where the spill occurred and all the different resources that were brought to bear on that spill. Over 5,000 vessels, over 700 skimming vessels, 100 aircraft a day, uh, 4.9 million feet of sorbent boom, 2.9 million feet of containment boom, uh, and over 40,000 people were involved. Uh, just a massive effort. All right, so let's bring it back a little bit more local. Um, and I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes because I'm at 25 minutes already um, about Lake Champlain and oil spills in Lake Champlain. My project was designed to increase preparedness in Lake Champlain. I wrote a new section of our local contingency plan to describe the various features of Lake Champlain that may help or challenge oil spill response on our lake. I created a scientific support network, um, kind of networking all of our academic professionals um, across New York and Vermont that would be available to help um, clean up a spill or at least provide some um, scientific knowledge to help us make the best decisions in spill cleanup in the lake. I also performed a uh, oil spill training for all of our marina owners on the lake. 
We have not had many spills on Lake Champlain. That's the good news here. Um, we do not have large oil transportation industry on the lake, um, but that hasn't always been the case. For a while, we had oil barges. That, um, that's how we got our oil and fuel delivered up to Burlington and Plattsburgh. Um, there was a large um, heavy oil spill in 1971 over in Plattsburgh that leaked over 42,000 gallons of number six fuel oil into the lake. Um, that was, it got trapped under ice actually, and they had to clean it up from underneath the ice. Uh, which is pretty interesting. Uh, more recently, there was a train derailment in 2004 where five train cars derailed um, directly into the lake uh, along those tracks that I showed you earlier, and uh, 23,000 gallons of canola oil leaked into the lake. Now, canola oil is what you cook with. It's a little less toxic than uh, hydrocarbon-based oil, um, but still can um, damage the environment just the same. And there's a few other spills listed on there. The major threats to our lake and Lake Champlain are marinas, home heating oil tanks. Many people still heat with home heating oil. Their tanks are either outside their house or in their basements and those tanks can leak um, or snow will fall off someone's roof and, and tip a tank over. Um, and that oil will find its way into the lake um, through uh, sewer systems or groundwater. Uh, vessel traffic, we do have some large vessels on the lake um, like the ferries um, and the um, the Ethan Allen cruise ship, and those are all powered by diesel fuel. So that's a, that's a large source that um, does threaten the lake. Highway tanker traffic, um, many, many trucks in the, in the, on the roads in the North Country um, that are delivering uh, gasoline and, and home heating oil. So, you know, when they have accidents on the highway, for instance, um, that oil can find its way into the rivers, which all lead back to Lake Champlain uh, and bulk storage facilities. Finally, by and far the largest threat for oil spills in Lake Champlain is railroads. Um, we have railroads running down the lake um, on both the New York and the Vermont side. Um, the picture in the lower right in Port Henry, New York, that's that same oil train picture that I showed earlier. Um, and in 2014, the, um, there was a, a huge glut of, of um, Bakken crude oil that was being transported along our lake uh, in the amount of 30 million gallons a week. Um, they're not transporting that amount anymore, um, but that could change given the price of oil and how oil moves around our country. So railroads are the largest threat to our lake. Okay, so uh, I'm just about done here. Um, most of the information that you saw today is from the NOAA Office of Response and Restoration. Um, that's our science arm that helps us out in the Coast Guard and the EPA when we're responding to oil spills. And you can get more information from their website. Um, just Google NOAA Office of Response and Restoration or NOAA Oil Spills, and you can get lots of additional information from them. Just a little shout out to the Coast Guard here. Um, as a member of the Coast Guard, we are um, completely responsible for oil spill preparedness, prevention, and response um, in the coastal zone, which is all the marine oceanic areas of the United States um, and territories. If anyone has any additional questions about the Coast Guard and what the Coast Guard does, um, or maybe if you're um, a senior in high school or um, starting to think about what you want to do after you get out of school um, and you're considering something like the Coast Guard or the military, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to hit me up. I'd be happy to talk about it further. Okay, and that is the end of my presentation. All right, so Jay has put together some polling questions for us. So just to check in on some of the learning you've had. And so I'm gonna launch this first poll. And so this should pop up on your screen. If it does not, um, Jay, actually, if you wanna keep sharing your, power, your PowerPoint, we'll um, use the information on your screen. You can answer in the chat box um, as well once Jay pulls that up here. And so the question is, what is the best sorbent material to clean up oil spills? And remember, this is which one's the best. Um, so you've got some options there. Looks like folks are submitting their responses. Great. So let's see, what do people think? All right, Jay, what is the answer? We've got a lot of responses coming in for sorbent pens, some for boom. What's the, uh, what's the best? Okay, so we're, I was a little tricky there because I put boom in there. But remember, containment boom is the rubberized stuff that we use to corral the oil. The sorbent pads are the best way to absorb an oil spill. Um, human hair and duck feathers do work quite well. 
uh, but they're not commercially available, so we don't use those. Great. All right. Awesome. And our next poll, question number two here. Jay, if you want to advance, great. So what is the largest threat for an oil spill on Lake Champlain? All right, let's see what folks think. Overwhelmingly railroads. Nice job, you got it. That was one of my last slides, so that was an easy one. Um, railroads are definitely our biggest threat currently. Um, like I said, we used to have a lot of ship and barge traffic um, decades ago on the lake, but that is um, largely gone. Um, so that's so ship traffic is not really a big threat to our lake anymore. Um, and I don't think we have any olive farming, so no threat of an olive oil spill. Awesome. All right, Jay's put together a really cool activity um, that you can do at home that simulates kind of what an oil response uh, cleanup looks like. Jay, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, this is um, something fun you guys can do. I know everyone's kind of trapped at home. Um, this is something you can do with just materials probably that you have around your house or in your kitchen. Um, but if you take a, a, a bowl um, or a, a metal tray, like you would cook a ham or a turkey in, fill it half full with water, and then you take some vegetable oil out of your cabinet. Now you can mix in some, um, some food coloring or some hot cocoa even to make it a little bit darker and easier to see. But take that vegetable oil and um, dump a couple of teaspoons into your bowl of water. And you'll see that the oil wants to kind of, uh, well, I won't give away what it's going to do. So this is for you guys to do at home, but, but dump it in there and then try a couple of different tactics. Like you can try a spoon, see if you can actually scoop the oil out, try a paper towel, see if a paper towel will absorb the oil. And if you're able to remove it from, from the water, you can try cotton balls, um, try a little Dawn dish detergent, maybe just a little squirt on there. That's like a, if you remember me talking about um, dispersants, that's a chemical dispersant see what Dawn dish detergent does to the oil, um, and then see if you can come up with any better ways to collect the oil off the surface of your water. Awesome. It's kind of a fun way just to understand how oil reacts and how hard it can be to remove from water. Yeah, that's great. And so we're gonna to transition to, we've had some phenomenal questions um, rolling in here, some really thoughtful questions about some of the stuff that you presented on. So I'm just gonna read through um, these questions, Jay, and we'll kind of get your opinion on them. So one question that came in that I was thinking about as well is why is oil stored so close to water if it is such a big contaminant for water? Yeah, our, our traditional methods of moving oil around are on ships and barges. Um, most of our, um, well, as, as geopolitical shifts and we kind of change where we get our oil from, but we used to get most of it from the Middle East and, and um, other countries overseas. So all that oil had to be transported across the oceans on ships and barges and then brought to refineries, refined. And then, you know, how does the Midwest get their, their gasoline? A lot of times it goes on barges and it moves around from the refineries up the Mississippi River and up into the heartland of the country. So it's just where all the transportation hubs, just like that's where all the early settlers went, right, along the um, rivers and, and lakes and waterways of the U.S. Great. This next question is about Exxon Valdez. And so they're asking, how did that spill happen? Yeah, so the Exxon Valdez um, left fully loaded um, of oil left Valdez, which is the end of the Trans-Alaska pipeline. And it left port. The captain was on board. Um, he may or may not have been at the bar the previous night. Um, I don't know that they have actual evidence that he was had been drinking. Um, but he guided the vessel out of the port of Valdez and through a very narrow section called the Narrows. And then once they got out of there, um, he turned it over to one of his mates. But what he didn't tell his mate um, on the bridge was that they had actually veered out of the shipping lane, um, which is where they try and keep all the main vessel traffic. They veered out of the shipping lane to avoid icebergs from a calving glacier in Prince William Sound. 
and he forgot to tell him to veer back into the shipping lane. And so he just kept going in the direction he was going and he um, ran over a reef or a rock structure that was about 10 feet deep and tore a giant hole in the bottom of the tanker. Wow. Um, the next question is, would oil drilling and manufacturing along the Gulf Coast uh, have to do with the red tide issue? Oh, interesting. So thinking about red tide and some of those plankton, um, those blooms. Yeah, I'm not aware of any direct um, correlation between the two, but uh, good thought process. And like I said earlier, the, the oil is just a big carbon food source. So when you have a large amount of oil or you have a, a large spill that's occurred, um, you've just provided a massive food source um, and you can definitely have a big outbreak um, you know, from, from algae and bacteria, which can have those cascading effects and create dead zones and things like that. So good thought. I don't know of any direct connection between red tide and oil seeps in the Gulf, but um, definitely along the same lines, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just pop in and add to that answer, you know, one of the big contributors to excess nutrients in the Gulf region is the Mississippi. And so thinking of the agriculture along that. And so um, red tide in the same way that we suffer from cyanobacteria blooms here in the Lake Champlain Basin um, is often correlated with inputs from the, the watershed. But it would be interesting to see what the research says about some of the oil drilling and manufacturing as well. All right, Ashley, we have a couple of ones with two thumbs up. I don't know if that's popping up on your screen as towards the top, but just as an FYI. Yeah, Carolyn, go ahead with that two thumbs up question. All right, the first, the first two thumbs up we have is from Karen saying, is asphalt and road surface waste toxic on the environment, question mark? Does it degrade? Um, I think the short answer is yes, um, but as all of the lighter ends that are still trapped in that asphalt are taken out during the um, refining process, um, most of what's left is that that tar and the um, and the asphalt, and it really is so locked in there that it's not like every time it rains, um, it's just pouring out of the pavement into our our wetlands because we wouldn't be allowed to use it for pavement. But if you notice, like after they fill cracks. Um, in parking lots and things like that, if we get a heavy rain, you will see a, so a small sheen come off of parking lots and things like that. So definitely some of the products that are used um, will leach out a small amount of hydrocarbon, um, but by and large that sun bakes them down in there and they're locked right in and it's, it's not coming out or leaching into the environment. Good question. Yeah, great. Um, another question that seems to be popping up to the top here is what is the, what is the best way to clean up an oil spill? It depends on where it is and the size of it. Um, you know, if we're talking about like Lake Champlain, like a spill in a marina, maybe somebody, um, you know, their, their boat sinks in the marina or they accidentally overfill their gas tank at a, at a marina. Um, if it's gasoline, we don't do a whole lot about it. Um, because by collecting it, we could make an explosive situation where if we collect all that gasoline in one place, you get a lot of off-gassing. And if somebody were to start their boat, um, you can have an explosion. So gasoline, we want to just let go. Um, diesel fuel or other kind of on the heavier end fuels, we want to absorb it and just get it out of the environment as quick as we can. Um, so using those sorbents the best we can um, and collecting them out of the environment or using a small skimmer maybe in, a, in an area of a marina where the oil has collected, we can throw the small skimmer in and then you use a vacuum truck, um, which you've probably seen driving around your neighborhood sucking out the, um, the storm drains. And it's the same technology and we just hook that giant vacuum truck up and it sucks the oil right off the water through that skimmer um, and puts it into a tank where they can then dispose of it properly. So that kind of leads right into the next question, Jay. Um, if it's saying, is recovered oil after a spill no longer usable? Great question. Um, it depends on how early in the spill we collect it. Um, in Deepwater Horizon, most of the oil that we collected using skimmers was able to be um, re-refined or centrifuged. So they actually spin it. Um, in a giant centrifuge and all the water particles come out and you're left with the oil and they can actually put it back into the refining process and reuse it. 
which is great. Um, it's, it's a great way to reduce the amount of waste um, oil that we've created that has to be then incinerated or, or buried or something like that. So um, many times you can reuse the oil, yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, question coming in from Colleen Hickey from the Lake Champlain Basin Program. She's asking, during the spring floods of 2011, were the oil storage tanks near Blanchard Beach flooded or do they sit at a higher elevation than the record lake level? Great question, Colleen. Uh, is Blanchard Beach Letty Park? Is that the global facility in Burlington? I think that's the big storage facility I talked about. So yeah. they have many regulations where they have to be definitely above lake level. Um, they also have secondary containment. So they have um, concrete barriers that are built around that whole facility um, that are designed to withstand, I, I couldn't tell you the exact number, but it's probably the 500 or 1,000 year flood. Um, we, the water did not come anywhere near to topping those um, during the 2011 floods. But if you had a facility that maybe wasn't as well established or regulated, um, that could definitely be a challenge. Um, I dealt with a hurricane response in New Orleans where they had um, 24 feet of water that impacted a, a giant um, chemical storage facility. And the tanks aren't actually um, bolted to the ground, they're floating. So they're just sitting there and the water came in and floated these tanks up. And then when they set back down, um, many of the tanks were damaged and leaked a lot of their chemicals. Um, so it's something that needs to be thought of, especially down on the Gulf Coast when they have big flooding events down there. They've got a, um, typically they either pump all the tanks full so they don't float or they pump them full of water so they don't float and damage other tanks. Great. Great, and um, actually just a, a time check, it is 12.53. There's a really quick question in the chat and then I think there's a great one to add on if you're okay with me kind of wrapping up the, the question side of things, Ashley. Sure thing. Go ahead, Caroline. All right, G Jason, the really quick one is, why is the word sorbent and not absorbent used when describing a material? Um, hmm, that's a really tough question, um, right? So. Adsorb, adsorb, uh, means that the, the oil would um, collect on the surface of something. Absorb is a sponge, right? So a sponge adsorbs something, so it goes into something. I think when I use the term sorbent, I'm just um, referring to sorbents in general. So I think it's one and the same. Um, I'm not really sure what the difference is, but it's just the term we use in oil spill world, call them sorbents instead of absorbents. Sounds good. All right. And I think the best one so far that we could possibly end on, Jason, is it says, any thoughts on what we can do to reduce oil spill products towards re replacements with renewables? What are your thoughts on just kind of how we as humans can um, take better care of our own properties, as well as any ideas on looking towards the future? Yeah, I'll throw out a quick, quick few bullet points here. Um, you know, one is, if you do your own work around a farm or around your house and you change oil um, in your cars or things like that, um, even like cooking oils, um, don't pour them down the drain, don't pour them down the storm drain. There's plenty of places that will take them for free um, and they either reuse them or they properly dispose of them. So, you know, same with any chemicals as well, right? It's the same, kind of the same thing. Encourage your parents or, um, or, or whoever um, is managing your where you live um, to properly dispose of those things. And I think that helps a lot because um, when they go into storm drains, they go directly into the creeks, which lead directly to the lake. That's why you see those little fish medallions on all our storm drains. Um, in terms of oil use in general, I think it's good to be aware of, and you can Google search this, how many products in our everyday life are, are made with petroleum-based products. Our, our lives are run on oil and petroleum-based products. So be aware of what you buy and what is using petroleum-based products. And if you can possibly get away from those, do it. And then, you know, everything else in terms of lessening our, our carbon um, uh, footprints and things like that and driving less, flying less, um, being less consumeristic, you know, all those things can help us reduce our dependence on oil and allow us to move more into renewables, which obviously um, are, are way better for the environment for many reasons, um, including using less fuel. Great, thank you so much, Jason. 
Um, I just want to give a virtual round of applause for Jason for sticking with us, answering all these tough questions, presenting on his work that is so important to not only our region here in Lake Champlain, but globally and internationally um, in crude oil transport. And so I'm going to launch a real quick poll. Um, and I'd just like to get some feedback on today's session. Um, so if you could just go ahead, it's just four quick questions um, and answer that, that would be wonderful. And Caroline is gonna share a little bit of information about our next session. So we are here with you all virtually on, Tues on Tuesdays and on Fridays from 12 to one, um, just offering this learning experience to connect and share some information. Um, and so I'll let, while you're all voting, I'll let Caroline just talk about our next session real quick. All uh, right, everybody, you should be able to see my screen right now. So this is just a friendly reminder. As Ashley just mentioned, um, we do presentations every Tuesday and Friday. So our next one is going to be called, oh gosh, Photogrammetry <laughs> um, 101 with Chris Sabic, the Director of Research and Archaeology at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Uh, so remember, please go back and register. You cannot use the same link. You will have to re-register and get a new link in order to be in. Um, Ashley is going to load the virtual learning page into the chat right now. That's where you can go and you can register. Also, just as a heads up, we are starting to do these uh, live on YouTube. That way, if individuals cannot use Zoom, some school districts are uh, making that so that's not a thing. You can either watch it live or after the end of each and every presentation, we will be uploading the hard copy of the video um, presentation onto our YouTube page and that's where you can also view it or share it with others as well. Um, so with that, I think we're gonna wrap up here. I know we've got another couple